today we'll be looking at how we can reduce fireflies in your scenes and turn really noisy renders with a lot of hot pixels into nice clean renders. And no, I didn't go and lower the samples or anything, I went into this scene and I completely stripped everything I did that I will show you in this tutorial to reduce fireflies completely. And I chose a scene that, to begin with, had a lot of fireflies and I'll go over everything I did to reduce all of them as well as going over how we can shorten our render times with some hidden tips that you don't see around that often. So let's get into it. So I've decided to use one of my scenes that was quite firefly heavy. A lot of specular materials, a lot of glossy materials, a lot of mixed materials and harsh lighting. These attract fireflies more than anything else. And I'm going to show you how we can completely revert that scene around. So there is going to be some tricks here that you probably already know. But I'm also going to show you guys some that just kind of stay on the low side and not many a lot of people tend to look over so of course the first thing everybody knows is hot pixel removal this thing at one compared to zero is quite a bit different but what do you notice about the image it looks crap now yeah exactly now you can compensate for this with a high amount of samples but personally i don't like to do this i think it's dangerous going below anywhere around 0.5 0.5 you're getting rid of just the amount of samples your image still looks sharp and it still looks nice and high quality and realistic but depending on your scene and the amount of samples you're using can vary on how low you can take this now if you're on direct lighting you're going to want to stay higher with it because direct lighting sucks up way more light than path tracing does it gets blocked in way more and as you can see this specular material looks nowhere near as nice as it does on path tracing and of course path tracing has a lot of settings such as the caustic blur and the gi clamp which help a lot now i'm sure most of you know what the gi clamp does it should be set to one by default but if we bring this down to zero it's going to suck all the light out of our scene but if we bring it up just till the light comes back the scene looks great and the fireflies are gone and of course you can bring this up the caustic blur will help a lot. I personally like somewhere around 0.3 for a lot of my scenes. And if you're on the PMC kernel, you could probably put that all the way up to 1 and maybe put the GI clamp a bit higher. That helps with getting rid of fireflies a ton. Now, increasing samples, 5,000. Increasing diffusing specular depth to maybe 20 each. That's going to remove a lot of our samples as well. Now, there's only with samples, there's a threshold. You get to a certain point, it will denoise your scene completely, but it will not get rid of hot pixels and fireflies. Because that's what samples are there for. They're there to get rid of noise and make the image look more sharp. So as you can see, the noise up here, as I let this render, will start to deteriorate, but the fireflies will not. When I first rendered this image, I did leave it around 5,000, because some images can... It, it it depends images there's no kind of staple for samples it depends on your image and what you're doing if i put this any higher you can see the noise is already lifting and we're at 500 samples so you can imagine what it's going to look like by 5000 if we kept going with this it's just going to add unnecessary render time and nobody really likes that now the next thing you can do on all of your specular materials fake shadows these help a lot, it consumes the fireflies, and if it's not on, it just kind of makes things look a little bit worse. I personally use this in nearly all of my specular materials. It just makes everything a bit cleaner and sharper. So, as I was editing, I thought it might be valuable to go over adaptive sampling. I didn't think it would really apply to this tutorial, but I thought, of course, there'll be some people watching who kind of wonder how to get rid of noise as well and of course what I've showed you with GI clamp and hot pixel removal caustic blur all of that does get rid of noise there is another thing and that's adaptive sampling the reason I wanted to go over this is because what adaptive sampling does is it creates this kind of like a threshold um, for really well not noisy scenes but scenes that have parts of it that are more noisy than others if you get what I mean so where you can use this, say for example, if I was getting 
Now, this scene wasn't too Firefly heavy, but it did have more noise than the other scene I was initially doing the tutorial on. So if I had tons of noise, say on here on the shiny bit, or down here, or around here as you can see it, uh, but none up here, right? Adaptive sampling, what that allows you to do is it does essentially speed up your render times. Uh, it allows you to put up the max samples quite high, you turn this on, and now these minimum samples is the amount of samples before adaptive sampling kicks in and focuses on these parts, right? Now the threshold is essentially like a float texture, so if you're familiar with that, 0 to 1. If this is on 70, well, 0.76, that's it working 76% of the time. Of course, at 1, that would be it doing it at, at its most powerful, and 0 is essentially doing nothing. Uh, so you can keep that wherever you want it and what you need it to do. Expected exposure, group pixels, just leave them, don't go near them. And minimum samples, you're best to just leave that where it is for most of your scenes. And if you're looking for some faster render times and less noise, this is an easy fix. I just thought I would go over this um, if you're not dealing with fireflies but uh, a lot of noise and grain in your scene. Now, at this point, as you can see, most of our fireflies are kind of beginning to lift, and they're not there. But you will be working in some scenes where fireflies just, they won't perish, they will stay, and they will not go. At that point, you need to tweak your materials. Your materials is going to be what's causing that, and your light sources. You're really going to have to try quite hard to deploy some, you know, problem solving on this, and figure out what why it's in the scene. It's, at, at this point, it's nothing to do with your settings, your hardware, what you're doing. It's your scene, 100% your scene. Daylights are, octane daylights are horrible culprits. For, these alone can literally give you a stupid amount of fireflies. As you can see, I know it's not fireflies, but you can see it gives you a lot more fireflies. Now, a couple things you can do with the daylight is mix it with a HDRI. Of course, I do that in most of my scenes. It just gives much more realistic light. Also, Octane Lights, they can be quite bad for it, depending on how you're using them, the scale of them, and how many you have in your scene. But with the daylight, messing with the sun colour and sky colour I find can help a lot. Also the sun size and turbidity. Did I say that right? Turbidity. Turbidity is a weird word. But that's basically all of it for getting rid of fireflies. There's not a lot, a lot of people know, but there's still a lot of people that don't know. I feel there's not enough tutorials covering fireflies and I felt like this was a good bit to kind of pinch on the start of this tutorial. Let me put my phone in silent. I did feel like this was a good point to start and just go over as next we're going to be going over render times because for you guys that are quite new to this, this is the most painful part and you will get used to the render times over time. But as you can see, I'm running 1780 Ti, and I managed to get my render times fairly decent. If you're coming into this expecting to get things rendered in 3-4 hours, that's not going to happen. This image here took me around half an hour, 40 minutes, and that's a 1080p image, 32-bit TIFF, and you can see that's just for an image. Now, of course, if I was rendering that as a sequence, I'd probably have it at 720p as it's going on the internet and I would probably have it in PNG and I would decrease my samples as well. So you can imagine it would be somewhere around 3 to 5 minutes of frame which is decent. And you can see this image is completely cleared up now which is nice just to go back to the fireflies. There you go, that image is completely cleared now. Your images may take different but just keep going over what I said and you'll get it. But back onto the render times. There's going to be a lot of little different things you can do, but Cinema 4D has some little tricks it likes to pull, which are making your render times longer and you don't even realise it. Aside from default settings, for example if we come here, settings, priority on the devices, the amount of GPUs you're using, here's the big factor. When I render, I don't like to work. When I, when I render, I like to put my computer onto that render. 
and nothing else. I don't like Google open, I don't like Discord open, I don't like Skype open, I don't do anything. I'll leave my computer, I go away, I read, I take my dog out, I work out, I shower, I do whatever other daily stuff I have to do and that's how I treat render times. I treat render times as a, as a gateway, a gap to go and get other stuff done. And because I'm not someone that's personally bombarded with work and I don't like to balance projects on top of each other, I like to do it kind of in an orderly fashion and get one done, move on to the next one, get one done, move on to the next one. I find it quite efficient to send something to the render with a lot of adapted threads going on and then trying to work and making it painful for myself because the render times are going to be double and I'm going to be working in a really, really slow GUI and I just don't enjoy that and I feel like it's a bad way to work. But the biggest thing about new people is you're going to try, you're not going to be patient. You you haven't built up that over time. You're going to be trying to get your render times as low as you can. And uh, you're going to get to the point you're going to sacrifice your work's quality. And that's just not how things work. You're going to have to spend more time on it, let it render a lot longer, and things will look much nicer. So the first thing you can do is set this priority to high. And that will help a lot. Maybe if you want to sit and you've got to do stuff on Google, send emails, you want to watch a movie, you want to watch Netflix, set it to medium. That's great. But the other thing I'm about to show you is going to be what's going to really affect this. Now this can apply if you're CPU rendering, but it also does apply as to what the amount of power your computer pushes into Cinema 4D. And because it's Windows, and well, when you install Cinema 4D, Cinema 4D tells Windows what it is. That's how a computer works. Did I open this? There we go. And because of that, this little thing here, by default, lower process priority, is checked. Because it's a renderer, and Cinema 4D is a huge program, it's going to consume a lot. So by default, it's pushed below in your priorities. So if we open up Task Manager, you're going to see here that if I go in the priority, it's set to below normal. But if I set this lower process priority off, it's going to be set to normal. And that's because Cinema 4D essentially uses something called threads, which are, a better word for that is instructions, the instructions of your CPU. Threads are the part of your CPU that tells your computer what to do. So the instructions are being limited here. And this little thing here, adapt thread priority, helps a lot especially when it comes to working while rendering but we don't want to do that today so we'll turn lower process priority off we'll go into our task manager and because we're going to idle our computer and go and leave it while it's rendering we can set this to above normal maybe even high but if you have lower process priority ticked as soon as you change this it's going to jump right back down to below normal so when it comes to rendering, even if you're working in huge scenes, this can completely help your C4D speed up. And when you're not on the highest end of machines like me, I'm my computer very, very much needs updated. Um, but we all know how expensive computer parts are, so let's not get into that. But this will help a lot. Now, if you are somebody that wants to work while you're rendering, you're gonna have to know that your render times are gonna be higher. And you're probably aware of that, but using your process priority can still help that. Now, the other fact of the matter is Cinema 4D and the renderer, the picture viewer, they're not separate applications. And the task manager is going to treat them as one application because it is, even though they're doing different things. Now you could run two instances of Cinema 4D and use like Affinity or something and push way more power into the renderer and then your Cinema 4D will be a little bit faster. But at that point you're carrying the weight of the world on your shoulders, there's no point in doing that. I always recommend leave your computer, go and do something else. If you've got one machine, you can't net render, you can't team render, you don't have a studio, you can't do any of that, you don't have four GPUs. <laughs> Just leave your computer. It's going to work out a lot better and you're going to feel more relaxed as you're working. And if you follow these steps with lowering, well, turning off lower process priority and setting it on the task manager to a higher priority, 
I wouldn't go too high because then your computer just will freeze when, as soon as you come off of Cinema 4D. And of course, closing other applications will help that because it, your computer won't try to push anything else into other applications. You see the, the amount of instances of Chrome I've got open right now. Get rid of them all. Close Skype, close Discord, close everything. Leave your computer, go and do something else. That's where you're going to find your fastest render times. Now, inside of your scene, if you've got a lot of cloners, you're going to want to put them on render instances. And if your scene is still pretty high, you could probably mess with segments, turn them down, turn them up. As you can see here, I've got this sphere on default 24 because it's emitting, you can't actually see the mesh. I've got these tubes here. I've got this tube here, sorry, on the outside on 50 because it's quite in the middle of the frame. But these tiny little needle things I've got sticking through here are probably on about 12, maybe 15. Smaller objects, stick them on a lower amount of segments. The spheres I've got cloning here, 24 as well. I probably could have even went lower with that. So mess with your segments, see where they're at. Of course, this main sphere is probably on about 150. And that will help your render times a little bit as well. Now, in the main render settings, a lot of people kind of are a bit funny because they think that higher numbers, the better. Okay, I'm rendering this. I need it to be 1080p. I need it to be 60 FPS. Look, this is going on the internet. It's not going in a cinema. And internet kind of decomposes things because it likes to do that anyway. So don't render in 1080p. Upscale it later. There's really no point, especially if it's just going on the internet or someone's website. Just stick at 720p, 30, maybe even 24. Remember, movies are shot in 24 FPS, so it's not going to harm you at all. That's how I like to do my things with images. I'll do 1080p, sometimes I'll do 1440, sometimes 4K, depends on the image, depends on feeling. But a lot of these I just do for practice, shove in a folder, they never get saw again, so I just put them in 1080p. Um, but yeah, if you're rendering intros, ads, whatever you do this work for, just stick to, unless you've got like the most high end machine, there's really no point because like I said, it's for internet use. And if you want to read up on that, look at how the internet treats um, footage. Uh, you'll hear a lot of people speaking about it on YouTube and how YouTube likes to lower the quality of everything. Sometimes you'll be watching a video and you'll have it set to 1080p, it'll look 480. Now, of course, on the save, TIFF is going to make your images way better. Set it to 32-bit channel. If you want your images to look amazing, that's what you've got to do. But if you're rendering a sequence, you could always set this to PNG and have an 8 or 16. Personally, I've never rendered anything uh, in TIFF. I do stick to PNG sequences. That's probably because I just will get a little impatient at how long that would take to render at that point. But try these different things and see if they help. Octane is something, and a lot of other render engines, you've kind of got to settle for the render times. A anything you render with, you've got to settle. When it comes to 3D, you've got to settle for those render times. And that's the hardest part, what it seems at first, because you don't want the render times. You feel like they're stopping you. But really, the more you mess around with it, the more you faff about trying to get a render going, could be the time you're rendering and it'll be done. Personally, I usually do my renders overnight. I feel like it's the most best time to do them. Although when I wake up, my room is like 90 degrees, which is probably the worst part. <laughs> but whether you're going out for the day, wake up in the morning, get it rendering. Don't worry about your computer setting on fire, that won't happen. But finding the appropriate time to render and when to do it with the right settings is going to be what's going to make your render times. It's more or less on you than the hardware. Because if you make excuses for yourself and say, okay, I want this to render in two hours, it's a three second, it's a three second shot with 5,000 samples and it's 30 FPS, okay, so you've got 90 frames and you know, you've got five minutes of frame, that's not going to happen in two hours. And you've kind of got to settle for that don't try and work while you're rendering i feel like that's quite deficient unless you do have the ability to net render team render or you have an absolute beast of a machine which a lot of us don't and also the one thing you have to remember octane uses cuda cores 
So if you've got a 1050 graphics card, this 780 Ti here that I've got is gonna completely shred yours apart because, and that's why I bought it, it has a ridiculous amount of CUDA cores. And that's what's important here. CUDA cores and VRAM and RAM. These three factors, and of course your CPU is gonna be what's gonna really, really enhance your render times. And the more GPUs you've got, more CUDA cores. 1080 Ti's are the best, 1080 Ti's at the minute are the best on the market but they're so expensive. So the best thing I can say if you're on a budget, 780 Ti's are discontinued, they help a lot. So they're cheap. They have nearly as much CUDA cores as a 1080 and they're about 15% the price. 980 Ti's as well. But stay away from 950's, 960's, 970's. Go for Ti cards, uh, the overclocked ones really help with the amount of CUDA cores and the more VRAM you can get, the better. So just because you've got a 1050, don't think that's the best graphics card for rendering, because it's not. So I hope this helped. Uh, I didn't want to drag this on as long as I did, but helping people understand the way render times work is very valuable, and I don't feel there's enough tutorials on that. I've got some cool tutorials coming soon with some great realistic logos, and that should be out next week. I hope you enjoyed this tutorial. I hope it helped. You can find my Instagram and Twitter in the description if you need to contact me, please do. I'm always responding on Twitter. If you want to comment, ask me something, please do. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next tutorial. Bye.